Today is April 24th. I'm Serena, and welcome to the Seven Streams Bible Reading Method. We are in the Nation Stream today, and we are starting a new book, the book of 2 Samuel. Now, 2 Samuel was not written by Samuel because he has already died. Nobody really knows for sure who wrote the book of 2 Samuel, but chances are it was another one of the prophets, since it really was those prophets that kept track of a lot of what was going on in those days. So, we will continue the story where it left off with the death of Saul and his three sons. We'll be reading 2 Samuel 1-5 through today from the International Standard Version. 2 Samuel chapter 1 Shortly after Saul had died, David returned from defeating the Amalekites and remained in Ziklag for two days. The next day, a man escaped from Saul's camp. With torn clothes and dirty hair, he approached David, fell to the ground, and bowed down to him. David asked him, Where did you come from? He answered him, I just escaped from Israel's encampment. David continued questioning him. How did things go? Please tell me. He replied, The army has fled the battlefield. Many of the army are wounded or have died, and Saul and his son Jonathan are also dead. David asked the young man who related the story, How do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? The young man who had been relating the story answered, I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and there was Saul, leaning on his spear. Meanwhile, the chariots and horsemen were rapidly drawing near. Saul glanced behind him, saw me, and called out to me, so I replied, Here I am. He asked me, Who are you? So I answered him, I'm an Amalekite. He begged me, Please, come stand here next to me and kill me because I'm still alive. So I stood next to him and killed him, because I knew that he wouldn't live after he had fallen. I took the crown that had been on his head along with the bracelet that had been on his arm, and I have brought them to your majesty. On hearing this, David grabbed his clothes and tore them, as did all the men who were attending to him. They mourned and wept, and then decided to fast until dusk for Saul for his son Jonathan, for the army of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen in battle. Meanwhile, David asked the young man who had told him the story, Where are you from? He answered, I am an Amalekite, the son of a foreign man. At this, David asked him, How is it that you weren't afraid to raise your hand to strike the Lord's anointed? Then David called out to one of his young men and ordered him, Go up to him and cut him down. So he attacked him and killed him. David told him, Your blood is on your own head, because your own words testified against you. After all, you said, I myself have killed the Lord's anointed. So David intoned this song of lament about Saul and his son Jonathan. And he gave orders to teach the descendants of Judah the art of warfare, as is recorded in the book of Jashar. Your beauty, Israel, lies slain on your high places. Oh, how the valiant have fallen! Don't make it known in Gath. Don't declare it on the avenues of Ashkelon. Otherwise, the daughters of Philistia will rejoice, and the daughters of the uncircumcised will triumph. Mountains of Gilboa, let no dew or rain fall on you, and may none of your fields be filled with plenty, because in that place the shield of the valiant ones was defiled, the shield of Saul without an anointing with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the blood of the valiant, Jonathan's bow would not retreat, nor would Saul's sword return empty. Saul and Jonathan loved and handsome in life, and death were not separated. Swifter than eagles they were, and more valiant than lions. Daughters of Israel, weep over Saul. He clothed you in scarlet luxury and decorated your garments with gold. 
How have the valiant fallen in the tumult of battle? Jonathan lies slain on your high places. I am in distress for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been most kind to me. Your love for me was extraordinary, beyond love from women. How the valiant have fallen. How the weapons of war are destroyed. Some time later, David inquired of the Lord to ask, Am I to move to any one of the cities of Judah? The Lord told him, Go. So David asked, To which one? He replied, To Hebron. So David went there, along with his two wives Ahinoam from Jezreel and Abigail, widow of Nabal from Carmel. David brought his army with him, each soldier accompanied by his household, and they settled in the cities of Hebron. After this, the army of Judah arrived, and they anointed David king over the house of Judah. There they informed David. The men of Jabesh-Gilead buried Saul. So David sent messengers to the people of Jabesh-Gilead and told them, May the Lord bless you because you showed gracious love like this to your Lord Saul by burying him. Now may the Lord reward you with gracious love, as well as faithfulness to you too. And I will also reward you because you did this good thing. So strengthen yourselves and be valiant in heart, because your Lord Saul has died, and the house of Judah has anointed me to be king over them. Meanwhile, Ner's son Abner, the commander of Saul's army, had taken Saul's son Ishbosheth and brought him to Mahanaim. He installed him as king over Gilead, the Asherites, Jezreel, Ephraim, Benjamin, and all the rest of Israel. Ishbosheth began to reign over Israel at the age of 40 years, and he reigned for two years, even though Judah's lineage followed David. The period of David's kingship in Hebron lasted seven years and six months. Ner's son Abner and the servants of Saul's son Ishbosheth set out from Mahanaim for Gibeon. Zeruiah's son Joab and some of David's staff went out to meet them at the pool of Gibeon. One side encamped on one side of the pool, while the other encamped on the other side of the pool. Abner told Joab, Let's have the young men get up and fight in our presence. Joab replied, Let them come. So they got up, and twelve were counted to represent Benjamin and Saul's son Ishbosheth, and twelve to represent members of David's staff. Each man grabbed his opponent by the head, plunged his sword into his opponent's side, and they both fell together. That's why the place at Gibeon was named the Field of Swords. The battle was very violent that day, with Abner and the men of Israel being defeated in the presence of David's servants. Zeruiah's three sons, Joab, Abishai, and Asahel were there. As a runner, Asahel was fast, like one of the wild gazelles. So Asahel ran straight after Abner following him. When Abner looked behind him, he said, Is that you, Asahel? He answered, I am. Abner told him, Go off to your right or left after one of the young men and grab some more spoils. But Asahel would not stop following him. So Abner told Asahel again, Stop following me. Why should I strike you down? How could I show my face to your brother Joab? But Asahel refused to turn away. So Abner struck Asahel in the abdomen with the butt end of his spear, and the spear protruded through his back. He collapsed to the ground and died where he fell. Everyone gathered round the place where Asahel had collapsed and died and stood still there. Meanwhile, Joab and Abishai continued to chase Abner. At dusk, as they approached the hill of Amah, that is located near Gia on the way to the Gibeon desert, the descendants of Benjamin rallied around Abner, forming a single military force. They took their stand on top of the hill. Then Abner called out to Joab, Must the battle sword keep on devouring forever? Don't you realize that the end result is bitterness? 
How long will it take for you to order your army to stop pursuing their own relatives? Joab answered, As God lives, if you hadn't spoken up, by morning my army would have broken off their pursuit of their own relatives. So Joab sounded his battle trumpet. His entire army stopped pursuing Israel any longer, and they quit fighting. Abner and his army traveled through the Arabah by night, crossed the Jordan, and arrived at Mahanaim after marching all morning. Joab returned from his pursuit of Abner, and when he had mustered his entire army, nineteen of David's soldiers were missing, besides Asahel. Meanwhile, other soldiers of David had killed 360 of Abner's men from the tribe of Benjamin. They retrieved Asahel's body and buried him in his father's tomb at Bethlehem. Then Joab and his men marched all night until daybreak and arrived back in Hebron. After this, a state of protracted war existed between Saul's dynasty and David's dynasty. And the dynasty of David continued to grow and become strong while the dynasty of Saul continued to grow weaker. During this time, sons were born to David while he was living in Hebron. His firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam from Jezreel. His second was Chileab by Abigail, widow of Nabal from Carmel. His third was Absalom by Maacah, daughter of King Talmai from Geshur. His fourth was Adonijah by Haggith, his fifth was Shephatiah by Abital, and his sixth was Ithream by David's wife Eglah. They were all born to David in Hebron. While war continued between the dynasties of Saul and David, Abner was growing in influence within the dynasty of Saul. Meanwhile, Saul had a mistress named Rizpah, who was the daughter of Ayah. Ishbosheth asked Abner, why did you have sex with my father's mistress? What Ishbosheth said made Abner furious. So he replied, A dog's head for Judah, is that what I am? Up until today, I've kept on showing loyalty to your father Saul's dynasty, to his relatives and friends, and I haven't turned you over to David. But you're charging me today with moral guilt regarding this woman? Therefore may God do to me, and more also, just as the Lord has promised to David, since I'm doing this for him. I will take away the kingdom from the dynasty of Saul by making the throne of David firm over Israel and Judah, from Dan to Beersheba. Ishbosheth couldn't say another word in response to Abner because he was terrified of him. So Abner sent messengers to David at Hebron to ask him, Who owns this land? Cut a deal with me and look. I'll lend my hand in bringing all of Israel over to you. David replied, Sounds good to me. I'll cut a deal with you under one condition. You're not to show yourself in my presence unless you bring Saul's daughter with you when you come to see me. Then David sent a delegation to Saul's son Ishbosheth to say, Give me my wife Michal, to whom I was engaged with a dowry of 100 Philistine foreskins. So, Ishbosheth ordered that she be taken away from her husband, Laish's son, Paltiel. Her husband accompanied her, crying as he followed after her all the way to Bahurim, where Abner told him, Leave! Go back! So he went back. Later, Abner had a talk with the elders of Israel. He said, In the past, you were looking to see David made king over you. So do it then. Because the Lord has said this about David, Through my servant David I will save my people Israel from the control of the Philistines and from all of their enemies. Abner also addressed the tribe of Benjamin. Furthermore, with David's permission, Abner said anything that seemed like it would be good for Israel and for the entire tribe of Benjamin. Afterwards, Abner brought twenty soldiers to David at Hebron, and David threw a party for Abner and the men who were with him. So Abner told David, Give me permission to go out and rally all of Israel to your majesty the king, so they can enter into a formal agreement with you to reign over everything that your heart desires. So David sent Abner off, and he went away in peace. Right about then, 
David's servants returned from a raid, bringing plenty of war booty with them. But Abner wasn't in Hebron with David, since David had sent him away and Abner had left in peace. When Joab returned with his entire army, Joab was informed. Ner's son Abner visited the king, and he has dismissed him. He has left in peace. So Joab approached the king and asked him, What have you done? Look, Abner came to you. What's this? You sent him away? He's long gone now. You know Ner's son Abner came to mislead you, to learn your troop movements, and to learn everything you're doing. As soon as Joab left David, Joab sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the cistern at Sirah, but David was not aware of this. When Abner returned to Hebron, Joab brought him aside within the gateway to talk to him alone, and then stabbed him in the abdomen. So he died for shedding the blood of Joab's brother Asahel. Later on, David found out about it and proclaimed, Let me and my kingdom remain guiltless forever in the Lord's presence for the death of Ner's son Abner. May judgment rest on Joab's head and on his father's entire household. May Joab's dynasty never be without one who has a discharge, who is a leper, who walks with a cane, who commits suicide, or who lacks food. He said this because Joab and his brother Abishai murdered Abner after he had killed their brother Asahel in the battle at Gibeon. David ordered Joab and all the people who were with him, tear your clothes, put on sackcloth, and mourn for Abner. King David walked behind the funeral procession, and they buried Abner at Hebron. The king wept loudly at Abner's grave, and all the people wept too. The king composed this mourning song for Abner. Should Abner's death be like a fool's? Your hands were not bound, nor were your feet in irons. As one who falls before the wicked, you have fallen. Then all the people cried again because of him. Everyone tried to persuade David to have a meal while there was still daylight, but David took an oath by saying, May God do like this to me and more if I taste bread or anything else before the sun sets. Everybody took note of this and was very pleased, just as everything else the king did pleased everyone. As a result, the entire army and all of Israel understood that day that the king had nothing to do with the murder of Ner's son, Abner. The king reminded his staff, Don't you know that a prince and a great man has fallen today in Israel? Today, even though I am anointed as king, I am weak. These men, sons of Zeruiah, are too difficult for me. May the Lord repay the one who acts wickedly in accordance with his wickedness. When Saul's son heard that Abner had died in Hebron, his courage failed, and all of Israel was disturbed. Now Saul's son had two officers in charge of some raiding parties. One was named Baana, and the other was named Rechab. They were the sons of Ramon, a descendant of Benjamin from Beeroth, which was considered to belong to the tribe of Benjamin. The residents of Beeroth had evacuated to Gitaim and lived there as resident aliens to this day. Meanwhile, Saul's son Jonathan had a son whose feet were crippled. When he was five years old, news had arrived about Saul and Jonathan from Jezreel, and his nurse picked him up to flee. But in her hurry to leave, he happened to fall and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. Rechab and Baana, the sons of Ramon, the Berothite, left and arrived during the hottest part of the day at the home of Ishbosheth while he was taking a noonday nap. They entered the house as though they intended to obtain some grain and stabbed him in the abdomen. Then Rechab and his brother Baana escaped. While they were in the house, they struck him, killed him, and cut off his head while he was lying on his bed in his bedroom. They took his head and traveled all night along the Arabah road. They brought Ishbosheth's head to David at Hebron and told the king, Look, Here's the head of your enemy, Ishbosheth, Saul's son, who sought your life. Today the Lord has given your majesty the king vengeance on Saul and his descendants. 
David responded to Rechab and his brother Baana, the sons of Ramon the Berothite. As the Lord lives, who has saved my life in every adversity, when the man who told me, Look, Saul is dead, thought he was bringing me good news, I arrested him and had him killed at Ziklag as the reward I gave him for his news. How much worse will it be then when evil men kill an innocent man on his own bed in his own house? Shouldn't I avenge his blood, which you are responsible for shedding by removing you from the earth? So David commanded his personal guards, and they killed Rechab and Baana, cut off their hands and feet, and hung up their bodies beside the pool at Hebron. They took Ishbosheth's head and buried it in Abner's tomb at Hebron. After this, all the tribes of Israel assembled with David at Hebron and declared, Look, we're your own flesh and blood. Even back when Saul was our king, it was you who kept on leading Israel out to battle and bringing them back again. The Lord told you, You yourself will shepherd my people Israel and serve as commander-in-chief over Israel. So all the elders of Israel approached the king at Hebron, where King David entered into a covenant with them in the presence of the Lord. Then they anointed David to be king over Israel. David began to reign when he was thirty years old, and he reigned forty years. He reigned over Judah for seven years and six months in Hebron, and he reigned over all of Israel, including Judah, for thirty-three years in Jerusalem. Later, the king and his army marched on Jerusalem against the Jebusites, who were inhabiting the territory at that time, and who had told David, You're not coming in here. Even the blind and the lame could turn you away. Because they were thinking, David can't come here. Even so, David captured the stronghold of Zion, which is now known as the City of David. At that time, David had said, Whoever intends to attack the Jebusites will have to climb up the water shaft to attack the lame and blind, who hate David. Therefore they say, The blind and lame are never to come into the house. David occupied the fortress, naming it the City of David, building up the surroundings from the terrace ramparts inward. David became more and more esteemed because the Lord God of the heavenly armies was with him. Later, King Hiram of Tyre sent a delegation to David, accompanied by cedar logs, carpenters, and stonemasons. They built a palace for David. So David concluded that the Lord had established him as king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom in order to benefit his people Israel. But after arriving in Jerusalem, after leaving Hebron, David took more wives and mistresses, and more sons and daughters were born to David. These are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem. Shamua, Shobab, Nathan, Solomon, Ibhar, Elishua, Nepheg, Japhia, Elishama, Eliada, and Eliphalet. When the Philistines eventually learned that Israel had anointed David to be king over Israel, they marched out in search of him. But David heard about it and retreated to his stronghold. Meanwhile, the Philistines arrived and encamped in the Rephaim Valley. So David asked the Lord, Am I to go attack the Philistines? Will you give me victory over them? Go get them, the Lord replied to David, because I'm going to put the Philistines right into your hand. So David went to Baal Perazim and defeated them there. He called the place Baal Perazim because he said, Like a bursting flood, the Lord has jumped out in front of me to fight my enemies. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his army carried them off. Later, the Philistines once again marched out and encamped in the Rephaim Valley. When David asked the Lord about it, he said, Don't attack them directly. Instead, go around to the rear and attack them opposite those balsam trees. When you hear the sound of marching coming from the tops of the balsam trees, then be sure to act quickly, since the Lord will have gone out ahead of you to cut down the Philistine army. So David did exactly what the Lord ordered him to do, and he struck down the Philistines from Geba to Gezer. 
Lord, these changes we see today were steps in the right direction. Yes, things were turbulent and messy, but growth is rarely clean and neat. And your hand was on David, in spite of all the intrigue and surprises that were not always pleasant. May our faith be equally as unshakable as we find David's to be, even when our days are stormy. Amen. The book of 2 Samuel is the reign of David. Saul is gone, and what's worse for David is that his dear friend Jonathan is dead. The opening of 2 Samuel is grief for David. Yes, Saul spent much of his years on the throne trying to kill David. But David had a character rooted in his walk with God, and Israel was God's land, and Saul was Israel's king, and David respected authority. So he had respect for Saul, odd as it may seem. David's reaction to someone who had, quote-unquote, finished off Saul is another testament to the depth of honor that David had for the Lord's anointed. It is in order to mention that 2 Samuel 1-6 through and 1 Chronicles 11-16 through is a different perspective on the same time period. The two portions are worth reading concurrently so to get the full picture. David was now king of Israel, but needed to grieve a bit. His farewell song is a treasure. By chapter 2, David was rightful king now, but some of Saul's men just couldn't accept the transfer of power, though the time had come, and there was no other way to perceive this development. The battles and skirmishes are gruesome and unnecessary, But Saul's groupies couldn't get the bigger picture, nor the changing times. They were ebullient, and there were needless deaths because of it. It's never wise to be committed to a dead cause. Nevertheless, those loyal to Saul had installed Saul's son, Ishbosheth, as king over Israel. The move was illicit, but so it goes. He was there as king for two years while David was the rightful king installed at Hebron. He was there for seven and a half years. These years before he moved up to Jerusalem, there was warring between Saul's followers and David's. During these years, David had children with six different wives. Well, that was sure one way to pass the time. Though David's movement was growing and strengthening, Saul's was becoming weaker. In chapter 3, Abner changes to become one of David's followers and supporters. If he hadn't been so intense and spiteful prior to doing this, perhaps there would have been more credibility to his move toward David. But since he joined with David, before convincing every one of David's men, Abner was murdered. The intrigue and entanglement seemed to mark these years between the death of Saul and David being fully enthroned in Jerusalem. In chapter 4, there is another incident. There were two ruffians that went to the house of Saul's son Ishbosheth and killed him and brought his head to King David, thinking it would please David. David's reaction was opposite, and David had these two men killed. These were wild times in Hebron. Chapter 5 Finally, all the tribes gathered at Hebron and anointed David as king. He moves on Jerusalem, even though the Jebusites living there vowed David would not come in. But David, being valiant, he and his soldiers prevailed, and Jerusalem became the city of David. King Hiram of Tyre soon heard of David's triumph in Jerusalem and sent gifts. The Philistines, too, heard of David's ascension as king, and they marched out twice to end this movement. David was victoriously and decisively so. It's still called the City of David, almost 3,030 years later. SevenStreamsMethod.com is the home port for this podcast. Tomorrow we transition to the wisdom stream to the book of Psalms. Know that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Until tomorrow, I'm Serena, sailing with you down the seven streams.